Okay, so I am very happy to introduce today um, Anna Grimmel from University of Bonn. I will try to keep my uh, comments short. She got her PhD in computer science from Utrecht University, working on the, the joint advisement of Mark the Van Kampelt and Mark Burke. And um, she was in a few other places afterwards. And currently, she is a, a Bonn Junior Fellow at Halsdorf Center for Mathematics at the uh, University of Bonn. And um, I think I'll just let her speak. Please go ahead. OK, thanks very much, uh, Boris, uh, for uh, the short introduction. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about a problem that I've been working on for uh, some time. And this talk will be a bit of an overview talk of what is known uh, about this problem um, now. And uh, so I'll just start uh, with some basic definitions in the problem statement. Uh, I'm sure many of you are, uh, you know, are aware of these. Let's see. Uh, ah, OK. So. But let me just go uh, through this uh, in detail. So when we say a trajectory or a time series, then we mean a sequence of measurements of uh, locations of a moving object. And uh, we just um, connect these positions and we get uh, a polygonal curve, or um, we can also get a parameterized curve that we can view as a function uh, from a parameterization interval 0, 1 to uh, Rd, which is the space that this curve uh, lives in. And then we say, well, we distinguish the complexity of the curve and the arc length of the curve. So the arc length is just the sum of edge lengths and the complexity is the these number of uh, measurement points. And uh, now we want to look at um, the, a metric space defined on uh, these the types of objects uh, and define uh, a similarity measure on uh, these. So when you have uh, these curves, then you can also uh, think of a reparameterization, which doesn't really change the curve. It only changes the, uh, the parameterization of the curve. And uh, the reparameterization is just a function from this uh, 0, 1 parameterization interval to itself. And if we assume that a 0 maps to 0 and 1 to 1, then it's also rotation preserving. And the Frechet distance uh, then is defined based on these reparameterizations, essentially uh, minimizing uh, over all possible reparameterizations of one of these curves. And uh, what we measure is the uh, um, uh, basically, uh, how far these curves uh, can get uh, uh, from each other if we try to stay as close as possible. So as a metaphor that is usually used to uh, explain this for distance is that the two, uh, there's one person walking their dog. So one person walks on uh, one of the two curves and the dog walks on the other. They're connected by this leash. And they try to find a walk that uh, uh, um, uses as uh, as small as possible a leash, um, and the length of this leash is then the Frisch distance. So, um, so I think almost everyone here is aware of this definition. So uh, let me just move on to the discrete variant of this. So in a discrete case, we can, instead of uh, comparing this, uh, instead of look, looking at uh, all uh, points along the curve continuously, we, we can also just uh, measure uh, this um, and think about um, moving from vertex to vertex, and then these reparameterizations uh, turn into something called a traversal, uh, where that's just an, a, a sequence of pairs of uh, indices, or, and um, these pairs they correspond to the to, to points that are matched to each other, one from uh, one curve and one from the other. And then what we do is we just start at one one, and then each step we can increase. <laughs> one of the two indices, or we can increase both of them. Uh, and we always have to move forward. And then the discrete for she distance is just defined analogously as uh, minimizing overall possible uh, of these traversals. 
um, the maximum along the two uh, curves, the maximum distance along the two uh, curves. And now, Um, the problem that we want to study is um, we want to build, uh, we're, we're interested in data structures in this matrix space for near, uh, near sniper searching. And uh, this problem is defined as follows. So first for the near neighbor searching problem, we're given a set of points in a metric space um, defined uh, on a set X with a distance function D. And we're also given a radius R and then we want to pre-process uh, the these uh, points in this metric space to answer queries for uh, the a near neighbor. So we're given a query point Q, and then we want to re return some point that lies within distance R, if such a point exists. And um, so this is, in some sense, uh, uh, I mean, a more structured problem than the nearest neighbor problem. So in the nearest neighbor problem, we just want to return the closest uh, point. Um, but for technical reasons, we just look at this uh, simplified version now. And actually we go a bit further and we also look at an approximate version of this that uh, says that distinguishes between near points and far points and has this approximation factor C that uh, uh, affects the radius uh, or the distance uh, that uh, the points that we can return uh, uh, at which distance they are. So we say, so a point is near if it lies within distance R to the query point Q, and a point is far if it lies at a distance larger than C times R, and C is the approximation factor. And now the, the question is, okay, can we pre-process these points so that we can, uh, when given a query point, either return a point that is not far or return that there is no point that is near. Okay, so that's uh, kind of the equivalent of what we uh, discussed before, except that there's this approximation factor now that we allow. Okay, so what I want to do in the talk is I want to give a, a survey over um, what is known on uh, approximately neighbor searching for the discrete and continuous Fauché distance. And um, in particular, I will first talk about the discrete variant of the, the problem for the discrete Fauché distance talk about known techniques. And then I want to ask the question, how much of this extends to the continuous case? And that will be then the second part of my talk. So we'll first look at the discrete Fauché distance. And there are three techniques that I want to uh, talk about. So the first technique, uh, and I'll come back to this slide. Um, so, um, but yeah, so I'll come back to this overview slide. And I'll just start with the first technique. Um, so the first technique is based on multi-level uh, partition trees uh, and uh, some algebraic range searching. It has, um, I'm also listing here on this overview slide, uh, the advantages and disadvantages, but I am aware that these will become probably more clear as we go further along uh, into the talk when I explain uh, what these techniques actually are. So the first technique is for exact uh, um, the the exact near neighbor problem, and it's somewhat uh, uh, involved. It uses uh, this um, this whole machinery, um, and it has a relatively high query time and a relatively large space. But it's very uh, useful to look at it because it tells us something about the structure of the problem. It's always nice to before you go into approximation techniques to first look at exact solutions. Okay, so so this was, uh, okay, so, so the, it works as follows. So we want to build a multi-level partition tree uh, that is, uh, that we can use for uh, semi-algebraic range searching. So um, we'll first discuss the layout of the tree and then I will explain how to use it for these Frechet uh, range queries. And the layout is as follows. We, um, in the multi-level tree, so we can store um, the objects with our input objects are these curves and uh, we can kind of structure them according to one aspect in every level. And then 
in so in what we use in the first level as a structuring uh, to, to basically to search for is uh, just the first point of each curve. And we store our our, uh, uh, our curves according to the first point. And then in the second level, um, so the the second level there in the second level there are these secondary data structures, every uh, interior vertex of the tree has a secondary data structure associated with it that is built on all the uh, elements that uh, are contained in the subtree, okay? And now in this, all of these secondary data structures, they together form the second level. We store the points basically sorted by uh, the second points. And then we continue, we go on. And for every point along the curve, we, we add another level to the tree. And these multi-level partition trees, they are um, now uh, organized such that we can ask um, queries with uh, semi-algebraic ranges. So um, these are um, uh, uh, unions and intersections of uh, zero sets of polynomials. Um, and uh, I will explain to you how uh, we use those. But before I do that, I have to talk about uh, the, the Frechet uh, distance evaluation just between two curves so that we un can understand this better. So just for two curves, what is normally done to evaluate whether the discrete Frechet distance is smaller than a radius R or a, a threshold R, this is just so this is normally solved using uh, solving a dynamic uh, program. Uh, we uh, we can look at the a distance matrix uh, of um, the vertices of the two uh, curves, and um, then we can try to find a path that only a, a monotone path that goes from one one to uh, say uh, uh, M M if the two uh, curves have uh, each M uh, points. Um, to find, uh, yeah, so if there exists a feasible path in this distance matrix, which can be found by dynamic programming, only then there is a feasible alignment. And so we only visit um, entries of this matrix where the two uh, corresponding vertices are within distance, uh, Euclidean distance R from each other. And uh, now what we want to do in our query algorithm is we want to kind of emulate this decision, uh, this, this um, dynamic programming um, uh, algorithm. And we do this as follows. So when we have a query curve, we build an uh, arrangement of disks of radius uh, R. So R is our search radius. And these disks are centered at the vertices of the query curve. And we can do this during query time. And now every um, cell in that arrangement, um, you can uh, assign to it a zero one uh, um, vector, uh, depending on whether uh, the cell is covered by the disks of the, um, the i's uh, vertex or not. So, uh, every cell in the, in the arrangement can be uh, uniquely described by this zero one vector. And now if we, um, if we stack those zero one vectors uh, next to each other, we get uh, a, a zero one distance matrix like we had before for two concrete curves. Now, instead of having two concrete curves, we have our query curve, which is concrete, but then we have all of these other uh, curves in our data structures data structure which we uh, where we want to find um, basically just a subset of uh, of input curves that uh, that uh, satisfies certain uh, specification namely okay, namely they have the speed for shadings that most are so now what we do is um, we take just for a fixed sequence of cells in the arrangement we can query our um, our multi-level partition tree with uh, these uh, the semi-algebraic semi -algebraic ranges that correspond to this uh, these uh, um, cells here, right? So we can find uh, all the input curves that have that have their first point in this dark green cell here that uh, is specified by this uh, zero one vector, and then the we query in the second level with this uh, this this semi-algebraic range 
uh, that is here shown in this light green cell and so on to find uh, then uh, in the end all curves that traverse exactly these cells in that order. And then we have to repeat this for every matrix that has actually a feasible traversal that has actually a path from zero, zero to NM. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, relatively expensive, but uh, it, uh, it works and it's, a, it's an exact solution. Actually with this solution, you can find, you, you can do, uh, you can solve the range searching problem. You can actually, you can return all curves on that line set to range. But here in this talk, I just want to focus on returning one. So just the near neighbor problem and then the approximate near neighbor problem. Okay, I will I will come to come back to this to to, uh, to tell you what are the bounds that you get uh, when I compare the three techniques. Uh, so for now, just you know, I just explained the technique. So let me go to the to the second technique. Uh, which is based on locality sensitive hashing. Um, so this technique yields a very high approximation factor, but it's very efficient. So it's, it's also interesting. And locality sensitive hashing, which was introduced by Indik and Motwani, it uses this idea that uh, for similarity search, we can, uh, we can use hashing if the hash function uh, uh, maps uh, elements of the metric space that are near to each other, uh, to the same hash index with a uh, high probability and maps uh, elements that are far from each other to the same hash index with uh, a low probability. So there are these alpha one and alpha two probabilities here. Um, so, and these radii R1 and R2, when we assume here, uh, so this is useful when R1 is smaller than R2. And uh, so the ratio of the two will be the approximation factor. And also, um, alpha one and alpha two, they should just be uh, constant uh, probabilities. And then there's a whole framework around this that can boost these probabilities. And I will not really get uh, into that now. I just want to explain how a locality sense of hash function works for the discrete Frechet distance. So there's a very simple one that just uses a randomly shifted grid. So uh, let's say we have this, uh, this grid of uh, the scaled integer grid scaled with a parameter delta and we give it a random shift. Uh, and then we snap every vertex to its, its closest uh, grid point. And then uh, we use just a sequence of points um, as our search index. So that's our hash function. So what we do is we just remove duplicates that are directly next to each other, consecutive duplicates. So here, for example, I had uh, two green vertices and they get matched to the same vertex on the grid. And then this, these duplicates are, are removed. And now when we compare to hash indices, we compare them one to one. So we actually just completely get rid of the whole alignment problem, which is quite, quite nice. Um, but in order to, uh, to show that this works, we have to show these two probabilities. So when I, when I go back to the definition, we have this, uh, this A and this B, so with this alpha one and alpha two. For one of the two, we will just use triangle inequality uh, to say that, uh, okay, far curves, they will not uh, um, uh, have the same hash index because we choose the, the, the grid large enough. So then we'll actually have a zero probability there. And for um, and, and now what we want to bound is the, a failure probability for, for closed curves to be separated. And then for this, there's actually a simple union bound that we can use um, for uh, the probability that near curves fail to collide uh, in the hash index. So we just use, the, we just take the, the optimal traversal and then uh, we just look at the probability that two points that are matched to each other on this traversal are separated by this grid shift. And we take a union bound over all. Of them, and then um, we can choose this uh, grid with delta, and which is here. Uh, yeah, so the delta, if we choose that large enough, then we can bound this by a constant. Okay, so that's uh, that. Um, and now the third technique uh, is um, was by uh, Filzer, Filzer, and Katz, who said that actually. Okay, so when we had our paper on LSH, we, uh, we tried to improve this approximation factor and uh, we did this very inefficiently, but we thought that, okay, we cannot just have this 
large approximation factor, we have to do something. And then Filtz and Filtz and Katz came and said, actually, there's a much simpler method to get a, a small approximation factor, which is basically exhaustive enumeration uh, on uh, a, fi a fine grid that uh, you put close to the vertices of these uh, vertices. So we put a grid, a ball around each vertex, and then we put an epsilon grid intersected with that ball. And now we just enumerate all possible uh, K tuples that traverse the, this grid uh, uh, that have for sheets at most one plus epsilon are to the input curve. We store them all in, in a data structure and uh, we basically store the answer to this query in the data structure. And then when we get uh, a query, we just snap it to this global epsilon grid and look up the answer in the data structure, okay? And um, now one thing, okay, you have to be a bit careful with, we care about the complexity of the input curves and the complexity of the query curve. So we actually care about the complexity of the query curve a bit more and to have uh, a good, uh, um, dependency on the complexity of the query curve only, you can also combine this with the simplification, first simplify the input curve and then do this uh, technique. And then you're only, you're only dependent on the complexity of the query curve. Okay, um, now comparing these uh, three techniques, we get that um, this multi-level uh, partition trees, they, uh, they yield uh, relatively high space. So it's, um let's see so th this is uh for the discrete for she distance but uh so you have here this log log n factor that's exponential in m the complexity of the input curve i didn't do this analysis uh uh how you get uh to this but um so this is what you can achieve with this technique when your input curves have complexity m and your query curves have complexity k then here this all depends on an m and the query um, so this is for discrete Frisch distance in D dimensions uh, here. Um, yeah, so for also for the query, you have these, these high factors that are exponential in M. And also here, actually in 2D, you have uh, square root N because we need to, that comes from the symmetric back range uh, searching um, because you're searching with uh, disks. And then for the uh, locality sense of hashing, we have uh, this large approximation factor here, but it's it's quite efficient in terms of space and query time compared to this, and also compared to uh, maybe the filter of filter cuts uh, thing here. Um, the one plus epsilon approximation, you can do that in, well, you could say, uh, um, if D and K is constant, then you could say maybe this is a linear space, um, but it's, yeah, so, and query time is the uh, O of dk. Now, the other interesting question is, uh, what can we do for the continuous Frisch distance? So the big difference is that for the discrete Frisch distance, because you're only uh, you're looking at these discrete traversals, you only you always know when you have an input curve with these vertices, then you know the the query curve that has this input curve as a near neighbor you know exactly where the vertices are, right? So when you go back to this, think about this exhaustive enumeration technique uh, here, uh, we know exactly that the query curve has to have a vertex here in this ball and then in this ball and then that ball. Um, now for the continuous for citizens, you don't have that property anymore because you can match the a vertex to the interior of an edge on the other curve. And uh, we don't want to have a dependency on the arc length of the curves. So if you want to uh, do without this depends on the arc length of the curve, that's quite difficult. And for a long time, we didn't know how to do this even for curves in 1D. And now uh, we, know, um, we know much more about curves in 1D. And I would say this, the 1D case is uh, almost uh, uh, maybe completely characterized, but it's still an open question how to do it in 2D. Now for the remainder of the talk, I will just talk about the continuous Frisch distance in 1D. That means our curves just go back and forth on the line, on the real line. Uh, um, and I, but I will still draw them uh, as if I would draw them, draw them as a function graph. Okay, so for the first, uh, actually for the first technique, we also know how to do this in higher dimensions. So, and here I have to go uh, into a little bit uh, how, to, how to compute the, the continuous Frisch distance. So this is normally done by looking at this, uh, the parametric space of the two curves and 
um, there we know that, um, so here a cell of this per parametric space uh, corresponds to two edges, one from each curve. And we know that the subset of points that are um, within distance uh, delta from each other, that this is uh, an ellipse. So it's a, it's a convex um, set. So it's an ellipse clipped to the cell. And then uh, again, we want to find a path that stays inside these uh, free points or feasible points. You can apply the same technique that I described before with the semi-algebraic range searching. It's just that your predicates become more complicated. So before we only had predicates that were disks, basically. Now we have uh, more complicated predicates, but it's still possible uh, to do this. And uh, that's, um, so this is the only slide that I, that I have about this. I'm not going to go much further into the details here. Um, Yes, yeah, so in 2D, we can actually do this. Now for the locality sensitive hashing, we only know how to do this in, uh, for, in 1D for, um, for, the, for these polygonal curves in 1D. And here I draw this uh, curve as a function graph. So actually the, the x-axis, that's just a parameterization of the curve and the curve just goes basically back and forth on the, this vertical uh, line. Um, for, uh, for this locality sensitive hashing, we used uh, this concept of signatures, which are special types of simplifications. They, um, is, they are, so a, signature, a delta signature of uh, a curve, or we also call them time series, is a subsequence of these minima and maxima such that for two consecutive uh, minima and maxima, the distance between them is, is larger than two times delta. And any edge that we that you uh, skip in between should be shorter than uh, uh, two delta. So um, yeah, so it's a type of a very restrictive type of simplification. There's special um, not some special conditions in the ends also for the first and the last edge. And um, the ty these types of simplifications that are generated by this, they have this property that a curve that corresponds to an, a simplification edge completely lies in uh, the um, inside this edge. So it doesn't go uh, outside of the edge. Now, when you project this to the, uh, to, to the, to, onto this axis, then uh, the two sets are, are the same. Um, and then uh, we can look at these, um, uh, at the these vertices of the simplification and put uh, delta balls around these. So here in one D, they're just intervals, and we can show that, um, which is actually very easy to show. But uh, we can show that any curve that has a fresh distance at most delta to a curve A, then it has to visit these ranges in that order, so, and it actually has to have a vertex in each of these ranges. And now we have a property that's similar to what we had before with the discrete Fresh distance. Now, when we have an input curve, we compute the delta sig uh, signature, then we know at least, okay, the query curve should have uh, some of their vertices in these uh, signature ranges. Okay, so that's what, what we can use to, for, for pre-processing uh, this, um, uh, this input curve. And, but we need another property. We actually need to catch all of the, the curves. and. Uh, now, okay, that one is not on here on this slide, um, which is a bit strange. Um, okay, so I had another property, but it seems that it comes later. So now what we do to get, uh, to get an LSH is, uh, again, we use a randomly shifted grid. Um, so now this will just be a grid on the real line and it has this uh, shift. We compute the uh, R signature of the input curve, then we snap it to uh, the grid, and then we just use the sequence of minima and maxima as the hash key. And uh, here again, we remove these consecutive duplicates, but we also remove points that lie in between, uh, uh, say, a minimum and a maximum, which are not minima or maxima themselves. So those spurious. That's, I mean, there might be kind of spurious uh, small minima maxima. They, if they all get matched to the same grid point, then these are also removed. And the, uh, the query curve is snapped to the same uh, grid. And then again, we use the sequence of minima and maxima as the key. 
And then we can analyze the, again, we just analyze the failure probability for two close, for two, for two near curves to, uh, to, um, to hash, uh, not to the same uh, hash index uh, or to hash to the same hash index. And there are basically two things that can go wrong. So uh, well, one, one thing is that it could be, so what, what we want is we want that um, uh, all points in the range of the I signature vertex should snap to the same uh, grid point. So uh, all points on the uh, query curve uh, that lie inside this range should snap to the same grid point. And also uh, the second thing is that uh, all points that um, um, all, all short edges on the query, uh, they should basically be uh, snapped to the same. So the short edges should be um, just be contracted by snapping to a grid point. Um, and we can analyze the probabilities of, of these events uh, to happen. We can, uh, again, by choosing a large grid, we can get a constant uh, probability, failure probability here. Um, okay, so uh, the last um, uh, technique here is the exhaustive enumeration. And here, um, yeah, so here I use the second uh, property that I uh, mentioned before, which didn't appear on my slide. Um, so when we want to do this exhaustive enumeration, we also, we basically need to catch all the vertices of the query, right? So what we do is we don't, uh, try to enumerate all uh, query curves, but we enumerate all two delta signatures of query curves. Because when we computed the two delta signature of a query curve, then we know that, um, it, then we know that all vertices of this two delta signature, they should lie inside the delta ranges of A. Because these short edges that this curve can have in between, they have to be, uh, shorter than two delta. So if we make sure that they are all contracted, then um, then we're only left with vertices that actually lie in these uh, in these delta ranges. So that's basically the idea. Uh, and th so this will be a constant factor approximation, not a one plus epsilon approximation. Um, but uh, but this is basically uh, the the simplest uh, variant of this technique that uh, that we can think of. That um, uh, I um, put on the slide here. So what we can do is we compute the R signature of each uh, query curve, and then we put an epsilon, we intersect in the, these R ranges, which are, which are balls in, in 1D. We make them a little larger and we um, uh, intersect them with uh, an epsilon grid. And then we just enumerate all possible k-tuples that lie on, on this grid and that have Frisch distance at most three plus epsilon times r and store uh, uh, all these pre-computed answers in the data structure. For, for, so for each of these this generated candidate curve, we store the curve that generated it as an answer. And then when we get a query, we compute a two-r signature and then snap it to uh, the grid and then just look up the answer in our data structure. And the, uh, the approximation factor we get is then uh, five plus epsilon because uh, we also have, um, so because we computed this 2R uh, signature here. And uh, then, right, so then we use triangle inequality to show this approximation factor five plus epsilon. Um, and uh, in terms of the complexity, we get a very similar complexity as um, the bounds in the Fitz of Fitz uh, paper. Because what happens is when we generate these, um, these candidates, we have, uh, we know that the signature has uh, at most uh, K vertices um, because, um, So uh, I didn't uh, put that on the slide, but the, that is something that uh, we can ensure. Um, so that's another property of these signatures that is very nice. There are uh, simplifications that also give us a, a, a bound on the complexity. And then uh, we, um, 
uh, we basically just have to decide, okay, how many uh, vertices do we put in the first signature range? How many vertices do we put in the second and so on? But we have to move to the next range in every step. So then uh, we look at all possible uh, partitions of this type and they, you can uh, bound uh, these uh, by uh, this phenomenal coefficient. And then uh, in the end, the number of uh, tuples that you generate is just one represent to the power of K. Uh, so very similar to the, in the discrete, uh, uh, case. So this is for every input curve, and then this is times n to get the total number of candidates. Um, okay, so so this is uh, now the situation. I talked about uh, these uh, three, so the, the exact uh, solution for um, the continuous Fourier distance in, in 2D, and then uh, the LSH, uh, and then this 5 plus epsilon uh, in uh, um, in one D. Uh, now there is a there is a lot of room of improvement here, as you can see. This was just five this five plus epsilon. We could improve this to two plus epsilon, but we had this increase here in the space. It was very large. Um, so there was another follow up paper which was just got accepted to Soda, where we improve all of these bounds. We basically get the same. Uh, bounds here with better approximation factors, and we can also go all the way down to one plus epsilon. Um, and uh, so first I want to uh, uh, look at, at these bounds. So the, there are these filter filter cuts uh, um, bounds on space and cray time, which we achieved here for the five plus epsilon approximation that I just explained. Now in the uh, in the in the follow-up paper we can do we can we can actually use the same uh, data structure um, and show a better bound by a more careful analysis of these uh, 1D curves and how these um, uh, traversals uh, um, actually work in in 1D. They're very constrained and we could uh, show like uh, something that's stronger than triangle inequality. So uh, what we do is we show a, a theorem that says when you have an input curve with a delta signature, um, this would be P prime, sorry, and a query curve, uh, so another curve Q with a, uh, uh, a two delta signature, then uh, uh, this would be Q prime. <laughs> then if the two signature, signatures are within distance three delta, then also the input curves all the, also the two original curves, P and Q, are within Fréchier distance three delta. So normally with the um, triangle inequality, you would get a much worse bound here. You would, you would get, um, so just applied naive, you would get three plus two plus two. So, um, but uh, we can here, we can do, uh, we can do this um, basically without losing much, right? And that's how we get this, uh, improvement from five to uh, to three. And then uh, there are these other bounds that we get. Actually, we get more than I put in the table here for two plus epsilon, we also get a trade-off between space and, and query time. So we have more, more bounds there, but the ones that I want to put on the slide here are these. Um, and they look, uh, they look uh, a bit strange. Um, and we, we didn't know if, if this would be the best that can be achieved, but we actually showed some lower bounds also that, um, that indicate that these are actually tight bounds, which is uh, very interesting. Um, so in the last uh, couple of minutes of my talk, let me just say a few words about uh, these lower bounds. And they are uh, conditional lower bounds. Uh, so they are conditioned on the orthogonal vectors uh, hypothesis or uh, on the strong exponential time hypothesis, if you will. Also, because um, the strong exponential time hypothesis implies the OVH, um, um, you can also see it as conditioned on uh, SES. So the orthogonal vectors problem uh, is uh, the following problem you're given two sets uh, from. Um, um, each element of the set is a, a vector, a d-dimensional binary vector. And the two sets have a uh, size n each. And you want to know, is there a pair of vectors uh, that is orthogonal, one uh, from uh, A and one from the set B? And the hypothesis says that there's no strict, strongly subcritic time algorithm for this. If D is large enough, so 
uh, if d is basically log n and the dimension of the vectors. And uh, our bounds are of the, uh, of the following uh, type. They actually are bounds for the offline version of this uh, data structure problem. So we assume we have this, um, we, we built the data structure and then we get n queries. And we're looking at the total time that is needed to build the data structure and to run the queries. Um, and then we can do a reduction from uh, orthogonal vectors to this offline approximate near, near, uh, near neighbor uh, problem. And then we compare the bounds that we get. So uh, the data structure um, that we got, uh, our um, one plus epsilon approximate data structure achieved uh, this total time bound because we have to generate all of these candidates. So uh, it was, um, when I showed the table, the space bounds. So those were also pre-processing time bounds because the data structure just generates all of these candidates and then stores them um, in a table. The pre-processing and the um, and the, the space were just the same. And now, if we assume OVH and we can show that this cannot be improved to anything that looks like uh, this. So here we have also this factor n in this bound, and then m divided by k and to the power of little o of k for any function um, uh, f. Uh, and uh, so that basically means that both of these terms here, they are actually tight. And uh, then we have another bound uh, of this type uh, using slightly different reduction that also shows that the other bound, the, that was the, the two plus epsilon approximation is also tied uh, in a similar uh, vein uh, using also this type of reduction. So here we, uh, we have this, uh, uh, this term n times m and here we have um, this uh, term. And uh, this is, um, so I, sh yes, so for any function f. So of k, uh, let's see. Yeah, so that shows that in general, this bound cannot be improved. Um, but I'm not sure exactly what the, condi what the conditions on k are here. Yeah, and here we have this term n times uh, some constant to the power of k. And here we also have n times a constant to the uh, power of little o of k. Um, and I guess it's an interesting question also for which range of k uh, the, the reduction works um, because the orthogonal vectors problem has this uh, condition on the dimension of the vectors. And we actually managed to show this also for small values of k that are just super constant. Um, by uh, going through uh, a sparse OV, a version of a, um, a sparse version of the OV uh, problem. Uh, so let me go to the next slide. So the reduction works by uh, first going from the OV problem to an unbalanced OV problem where the, the two sets don't have the same uh, cardinality. Um, and um, then we go to a, a variant that we call one-sided sparse OV problem where one set uh, only contains vectors that have few ones. Every uh, vector in that set only has k ones. And uh, then we can show um, our bounds also for, for small k. And the gadgets just look uh, um, like this. So we so they're very simple. So a zero, we have to encode the D01 vectors and we just encode a zero in an A vector just as a, a straight, uh, um, line, so there's no, we don't, yeah, so these are just connected, so that's just uh, a, a straight line. And the one, uh, a one and an A is, is um, uh, encoded by uh, a big uh, zigzag, and a zero in the a B set is uh, encoded by a smaller zigzag, and a one in the B set is, uh, again, just a flat. When you look at uh, the Fréchet distances of these, then the only so the the interesting pair is uh, or the the bad pair, let's say, that breaks um, orthogonality and it also makes the Fréchet distance go high is uh, if you have a one in the A set uh, at the same position where there's a one in the B set, because then you have uh, this big zigzag in, in this one here, 
So you get this uh, distance is a Frechet uh, distance. Um, but all uh, the other pairs, so uh, one and B and a zero and A, they have smaller Frechet distance and uh, a zero and B and one and A, they also have small Frechet distance. So we can recognize uh, this. So when um, the Frechet distance is uh, uh, um, large, then the, um, uh, the two vectors are not orthogonal. Um, so yeah, so that's about it for, uh, for my talk. And um, so this is the, the table again, and this is the list of uh, references. So thank you very much for listening to my talk.